Here now, former NYPD inspector and attorney Paul Morrow. Paul, this really just has me livid. This is the charge, and this is the part that got me right here with this manslaughter in the second degree. Uh, it says this, and when the risk is such a nature and degree that disregards of uh, constituents uh, constitutes a gross devastation from the standard of conduct that a reasonable person, a reasonable person, would observe in this situation. So what is a reasonable person? I mean, was he just supposed to let the guy go in there? After he said that he was going to assault someone, after he right. said that he wanted to die, was he just supposed to allow this guy to do this? He's done it before. Lawrence, imagine that you're on that subway car, or maybe it's one of your loved ones. And, you know, something none of us are supposed to talk about is that in the subway, women are inordinately targeted. So let's just take, you know, imagine it's your mother, it's your sister, or somebody's daughter, right? Don't you want a Danny Penny, a penny on that subway to protect her from this kind of thing? Let me tell you what's going on here. The grand jury process was taking place. It was proceeding along the normal rails these things go along. When you have a case like this that's legally dicey because there's a very clear self-defense uh, defense here, it would normally have gone to a grand jury of Daniel Penny's peers to decide what the charge mm -hmm. should be. Mm -hmm. My gut tells me they're not going to get that reckless charge in a grand jury, right? Yeah. So, you get some protest. By the way, that protest completely contrived. Let me ask you something. If you're a protester, do you jump on a live train track without assurance that the train's not going to come barreling exactly. in there? They knew that train was shut off. So that whole thing's contrived as well. Okay, so something's baked into the mm -hmm. cake here. But to get to the point, they didn't want this to go to a grand jury, and they didn't want to wait. They were getting a little political heat. Now, when I say they... Who am I talking about? I understand Alvin Bragg is a little bit the face of this thing, and he's certainly involved, but we can't excuse the mayor. That's right. I'm telling you that at first, Eric Adams was handling this in a very statesmanlike way. He didn't want to put his thumb on the scale the way the AOCs of the world always want to and create mm -hmm. that narrative. You got a little political heat from the papers, from the protests. All of a sudden, everybody starts trembling. The NYPD does not make this arrest unless they're ordered to. There's no way they took unilateral action here. The only place that that order could come from is City Hall. So Alvin Bragg and Eric Adams almost certainly collaborated on this decision. It's a political decision, not a criminal justice decision, which is not the way our system is supposed to work, and that's the shame of it. Well, Adams is a political chameleon, okay? He does what's ever politically expedient for him at the time. You know, I gave yep. him credit at the very beginning. But this is what he does. When, when the rubber meets the road, you get his true feelings. And we've invited him on the program several times before he became mayor. And now that he's mayor, he never answers his phone, his private phone or his city hall phone. Uh, Paul, thanks so much for joining the program, brother. Thank you for having me. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.